for joining us this afternoon as we talk about authentication without aggravation. Uh, student validation that respects privacy, increases accessibility, and eliminates bias. Today, our three speakers will be myself. I'm Dr. Mac Adkins, founder and chief academic officer uh, here at Smarter Services. I'm joined by my colleague, Jason Phil, who is our chief executive officer, as well as our chief technology officer. And we're joined by our colleague from Typing DNA, Alex Losef, who's an account executive there with Typing DNA. So we're excited to share some information with you today that I think you will find practical and helpful as we're all trying to provide uh, teaching and learning uh, in the COVID era. So as educators, we all know that assessment of learner mastery is very important. When we assign a grade in a course, and when we, our institutions confer a degree, we're saying to the world that that person possesses the knowledge, skills, traits, attributes, dispositions that they need to function as a professional. So it's very important when we assign that grade that to a high degree of confidence, we know that it's that individual that did the work in the course so that when they demonstrate that mastery, that, it's conf that we're confident that it came from the registered student, right? Well, that process is made even more difficult in e-learning because the faculty member and the student are separated by time and space. So whereas in a face-to-face -face course, an instructor may observe a group as they're working on a group project or they may, he may or she may observe students as they're working on a paper in class, or they may observe a student as they're taking a test. But when the student can't see, or when the faculty member cannot see the student actually doing the work because of distance learning, how can they know that that is the person doing it? And this situation is made even worse this year because of COVID, because now there's more students studying online than ever before. Many students are studying online for whom it was not their first choice. Many students are stressed out by this whole thing of having to study online. Uh, and so there's just more opportunities uh, for learners to, to get help, unauthorized help in their online course. And that's the fact that many students in online courses have help, unauthorized help in doing that work. As someone in the chat stream just said, they knew a story about a family who received a degree uh, because there was one person registered and everyone did the work. Well, I think there's lots of family help taking place during COVID. Uh, helicopter parents, they're well-meaning, right? They're paying that tuition. They just wanna see that son or daughter get a good grade. You know, because we as parents, we, we know how intelligent our students are, right? We just wanna make sure they demonstrate that properly through their coursework. So we help them out a little bit. Ah, nothing wrong with that, right? Well, kind of is because it's the student that's getting the grade. Or maybe it's a spouse. Many times there's one spouse who's already gone through the college experience and their spouse hasn't. So, you know, what's wrong with helping out a little bit, right? We're just helping the family, right? A rising tide floats all boats. Uh, or you may have friends or classmates that you call on or so many ways that we can collaborate electronically on projects, on papers, on discussion board postings. There are a few schools over the past 24 months who have received severe fines and in some cases even lost athletic eligibility because tutors and coaches were helping athletes by doing the work for those athletes in their online courses. And so you see there's lots of different scenarios. Of course, there's many different websites that you can go to. You can actually pay someone to take your entire course for you. And of course you can pay someone to write certain papers for you. So there's many different ways that persons have someone other than themselves doing the work in online courses. So what have we done in an online course when it comes to learner authentication? Typically what we do is we say, hey, we're gonna measure this mastery through an exam. And during that exam, we're going to authenticate the learners. And during the days of COVID that has been through virtual proctoring. Well, back in April, kind of in the beginning of COVID, Educause did a poll and they showed that over half, it was 54% of schools were using some kind of remote proctoring service and that 23 more percent were planning on doing so. If Educause were to redo that survey now, they might find that about three out of four schools are doing some kind of remote proctoring. And that's great. That's very appropriate. We encourage that. Proctoring exams is needed when it comes to making sure that the learner has mastery. 
So it's appropriate, but it's not complete. Learner authentication during an exam, monitoring an exam is absolutely necessary, but you guys know that there's so many other parts of an online course through which the learner demonstrates mastery. Could be their discussion board post, could be papers that they have to write, could be some kind of project that they come up with, or it could be some form of authentic assessment. In fact, many schools, because of COVID and because of the whole proctoring problem, have said, look, we're just not going to proctor. We're going to shift to an entirely authentic assessment model where the student demonstrates through something they create or something they write that through those projects, they demonstrate what they know and what they can do with that knowledge. And that's great. That's a very well-respected form of authentication. But guess what? It's very important that we authenticate the learner for that authentic assessment. And many times that's not happening. So typically, we do learner authentication during exams, and typically the authentication is done by facial recognition involving a webcam. So the student has to hold up their ID to the webcam as a form of documentation of who they are. And then the, the facial biometric makes sure that the student who starts the test is the same student who takes the test throughout the test. So that's facial biometrics during an exam. But guess what? Students are pushing back. In fact, one of the, the resource links that we'll send you after this webinar is a link to this article about students pushing back. And it tells the story at many institutions, some of which who have their logos here, uh, at which students have filed petitions and or filed legal proceedings against their school saying that this facial recognition violates their rights as a student. And so we'll send you that link to the article, read about it, you probably know about it. At your institution, it may be going on right now. So we're, we've been using facial recognition, but students are pushing back. They are aggravated about having to use facial recognition for their authentication and for their monitoring. So how are these students aggravated? Well, there's four different categories, if you may, of their aggravation. First of all, they're aggravated about privacy. They feel that their personal space is being invaded. Uh, this may be the case for students who are living in poverty. They're really ashamed of the environment in which they live. Or maybe there's other parts of their environment that they'd like to keep private. Maybe there's objects on the wall or on their desk that are private that they don't want someone to see. Not only is that their environment um, invaded, but they feel that their computing device is being invaded as well because the software is taking over and it's monitoring their computing device. Uh, they're uncomfortable about a stranger, someone they don't know, observing them as they're doing these activities. And it could be things that are unavoidable, children, dogs, uh, siblings, other people coming into the room uh, in their private space. And this is an aggravation to students. The second way that they're aggravated for many students, and this is a growing number of students, is they're aggravated with accessibility. There's a category of neurodiverse learners that when they are being observed via webcam, experienced a truly heightened level of anxiety. It's a level of anxiety similar to what you might experience of stage fright when you get up to do public speaking. When they're observed on that webcam, it evokes all of those emotions and it truly distracts those neurodiverse learners from being able to focus during the exam. Uh, there's other categories of neurodiverse learners who do what's called stimming. This is self-stimulatory behavior. This could be repetitive body movements. It could be repetitive sounds. But these are things that they do as, as coping behaviors to help them focus. And while these behaviors do help that person focus, they could be tracked or identified by the proctoring software as a potential violation, and that aggravates students. So these neurodiverse students need to be able to test uh, in a workflow that's, that's free from webcams. In fact, back in April in that same poll by Educause, they asked uh, schools, uh, was their proctoring process, was it accessible? And 26% uh, of schools said no. We're aware that there's something about our proctoring practice online that does not meet accessibility standards. So that, maybe these students have a reason. They're not just aggravated, perhaps they have a reason to be aggravated with the uh, being forced to test via webcam. 
And then the, the next one is aggravation with the technology. Uh, you've read much in the media and you know, you've probably talked with students and you know that not all learners have access to broadband internet and or webcams at their home. That's a problem. Uh, students are concerned about what data is being observed on their computer. You know, is that proctoring software looking at their browsing history? They distrust that the software that can access their webcam uh, during the test uh, could also access their webcam at some time other than the test. How, how would they know, right? And they have concerns about other data that's being collected and how that data is being stored. And the last category of aggravation is aggravation with bias. Uh, much has been said about learners of color, especially when they're in context where the lighting is not strong, uh, that they receive false positives. Uh, English as second language learners uh, may not understand the promptings of, of proctors. And then for some religious reasons, some persons do not want to remove head coverings and such. And so there is aggravation with bias when you're forced to use a webcam. So how in the world then <laughs> Can we do authentication without aggravation? What we've said so far is that we as educators, the onus is on us when we give that grade, when we confer that degree, that we can prove to the world that this student possesses this acceptable level of mastery. But how can we do that when we're not where we can observe the student? Well, historically we've done it through exam proctoring using a webcam but students are pushing back about that. They're saying that webcam invades their privacy, that it has technology problems, that there's bias, that students with accessibility concerns. And so there's, there's things about that solution that just aren't perfect. And so we should not force all students to, to test and authenticate using their webcam. There needs to be another option. Well, what is that other option you might ask? Well, I'm glad you're here today because that's what we're gonna tell you about. Uh, many of you have been using Smarter ID and what Smarter ID historically has done is we've taken that webcam that during the proctored exam authenticates the student via facial recognition, and we moved that facial recognition to the course. So at random times that you as an educator control, the student is prompted to authenticate using their webcam during the course in addition to during the exam. So that way, even if you're using authentic assessment, you're getting some learner authentication. And that's great, that was a move in the right direction. But all of these concerns that students have with proctoring via webcam, they also have with learner authentication via webcam during the course. That's why we're so pleased to have partnered with Typing DNA that uses keystroke biometrics. And you're about to learn a lot about keystroke biometrics. And like me, you're gonna be excited about what you hear because keystroke biometrics is it's non-invasive, it's user-friendly. Uh, and just like the facial biometrics, it takes place during the course, not just during an exam. And so the authentication via the, the keystroke biometrics reduces student aggravation in the following ways. First of all, it calms their privacy concerns. They're not having to hold up their ID. They're not having to show on a webcam. It increases the accessibility because there's no stage fright triggers because they're not on camera. It solves the technology problems because you don't have to have a broadband connection. You don't have to have a webcam. You just have to have a keyboard, which you're gonna to have to have anyway uh, to, to work in your online course. And then those issues of bias, dealing with, with lighting and physical appearance no longer apply. So I hope you can see that this solution of using keystroke biometrics for learner authentication during the course is a real step forward in the work that we're doing as educators to make sure that the student that gets the grade is the student that's doing the work. So with that said, let's learn a little bit more about typing DNA. We'll shift it over to Alex to tell us more about it. Hi, Mac, thank you uh, for the introduction. Let me just make sure that I share my screen with everybody. Uh, okay. okay, and we are seeing it now. Okay, so this is where we left off. So yeah, really, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction. I'm honored to be here and uh, a big shout out to everybody participating in today's webinar. Um, um, I'm trying to be mindful of the time we've got. Uh, there's definitely a lot to say on um, typing biometrics. What uh, I'm going to touch on uh, today is a little bit about our company, 
what typing biometrics is, how it works, uh, what the current challenges are in online education. And when we're talking about fraud prevention uh, and how we propose to address these uh, challenges with fraud in ac and academic integrity in the age of online learning remote. Um, so starting off with the company, Typing DNA is a cybersecurity company at heart. Um, and we are focused on typing biometrics. Um, the technology, what it does is it allows us to recognize people based on how they type. Um, a brief history of the company. We're a venture back company. We started in Europe, um, but our first customers were in the US. So after a couple of investment rounds, we uh, moved the HQ of our company to the US. Um, our latest investment round was this year in January. Uh, the lead investor was Gradient Ventures, which is Google's AI focused uh, VC. Uh, and it's something that we're really proud about because they are a fund specialized in investing in only the most promising artificial intelligence technology. So for us uh, or for any startup, really uh, getting um, investment money from Gradient is very much like uh, being admitted to one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Uh, so that's really exciting. Mm. In terms of where our solution use is used, we have multiple use cases, and I'm just going to touch briefly on some of these. Uh, we work with banks to authenticate people when they're accessing their online banking accounts, uh, when they are accessing their mobile banking accounts, when they are um, performing electronic payments and they need uh, authentication for such payments. Um, we also work with large enterprises um in the technology and the retail sector to authenticate their employees uh, both when they're at the office and now more and more so uh, when they are at home uh, but we also support a significant number of customers in the education sector uh, where our technology is used to boost academic integrity um, sometimes meet uh, certain state or national uh, compliance requirements surrounding uh, student authentication, uh, fraud prevention, academic integrity. And we do all this in, just like Max said, a, a, a very user-friendly and non-intrusive way. Um, so what's, um, what's uh, typing biometrics? Um, I'm sure that everybody is familiar with other biometric technologies such as uh, fingerprint or face recognition. Uh, pretty much every phone nowadays has uh, a biometric sensor and a biometric technology on it. Uh, these classical biometrics, we can call them uh, physical biometrics. So they measure uh, some very identifiable static traits on somebody's body. Uh, typing biometrics is uh, behavioral biometrics. So the type of features that we look at are some dynamic features, some behavioral features. Um, and probably the most common behavioral biometric that people on this, uh, this um, webinar know of is voice recognition. So you can pretty much compare it with that where voice recognition recognizes people based on their speech uh, typing biometrics recognizes people based on how they type. It's literally the same way of uh, authenticating people based on uh, a com communication method. Um, and what I have here on this slide is uh, basically a high level uh, explanation of what the authentication process looks like. So step number one is we record the typing behavior of somebody. Um, step number two is then this typing behavior gets sent over to us uh, and where we extract the typing features from, uh, from, uh, from that typing behavior. We really look at some very specific, specific uh, traits and features that are unique and stable over the course of a user's lifetime. 
And then we take those uh, features and feed it into our machine learning algorithm. And then the following step, step number four is the authentication step. This is where we tell you if we believe it's the same person or not based on the way they type. Um, so I think that the interesting part here is the behavior recording. Um, so what kind of data do we look at? Uh, we look at key press and key release times uh, for desktops. We also look at mouse movement, special keys, upper cases, all that sort of um, data. For mobile devices, where we can, depending on the way that the solution is integrated and the, the channel in which is working, we are using also the accelerometer and gyroscope. Uh, movement. So we're taking into account the way that the user moves their phone uh, when they're typing, which allows us to have uh, an increased security. Um, now, I really want to touch briefly on why uh, typing DNA has had quite some success lately. Um, and um, it's because of the new normal which um, I'm actually taking uh, uh, an idiom here from work from anywhere, it's study from anywhere. So probably as you all know, uh, we are living some strange times um, and probably this behavior where you can be studying from anywhere will still be around even after the health crisis passes. We're certain that the work from home uh, to some degree will stick. So COVID, opened the Pandora's box and brought about a permanent change in people's behavior. And study from anywhere presents a set of new challenges to ensuring academic integrity. Um, and when we think about students, right, when they're taking part in assignments in team projects and homework, uh, which are all very important parts of the academic process, universities don't really know who their students are, where their students are, and so on. As somebody was um, was uh, chatting in the chat box, sometimes entire families uh, take part in a collective uh, um, collective degree, if I if I can say so. Right. So the problem is that right up until this point, the solutions that most of, uh, most of the universities had and most customers uh, in, in, in the education space have were revolving around browser lockdowns or using uh, usernames and passwords. And there is uh, an inherent issue with these solutions, right? Um, they're really good at preventing account takeovers, right? So the, the kind of, uh, but pa passwords are really useful, for instance, when we're talking about online banking, right? Where um, the attacker accesses the account without the consent of the uh, account holder. Um, the problem, however, with these solutions, right? Like passwords is that, well, they are fallible to uh, account sharing. Uh, nobody is taking over an online, uh, 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 online learning account from a student without their consent. It's obvious that they're in on the cheating, right? Uh, and they're giving out their passwords. They might be sharing devices. Uh, they might be sharing every possible way to uh, cheat because it's in their uh, benefit, quote unquote, uh, to partake in the fraud, whereas in the traditional cybersecurity paradigm, it's in the detriment of the account holder to uh, have fraud taking place. So um, here again, um, how do we uh, how do we solve this? Right? How do we prevent account sharing? And of the three types of ways that you can secure accounts, which are uh, a knowledge-based security, such as with passwords, where you rely on something secret, uh, a possession-based uh, uh, security, such as uh, you know making sure that the student always uses the same laptop or the laptop is restricted, such as a lockdown browser. Um, 
And the third category, which is biometrics, the only way that you can secure uh, account against account sharing is with biometric solutions. And this is because biometric solutions are the only authentication means that allow you to tie a digital identity to a physical one. So inherently in biometric solutions, the way that you authenticate is by being who you are. It is impossible for somebody else to be yourself, right? So that's the way biometrics prevent um, account sharing. And the most common used um, biometric in online education is facial recognition, which then again, as Max said, brings on a whole new set of, of challenges. And I, I really want to um, get a bit into these uh, details, the most important ones, which I think are indeed um, the hardware, so the, the technology requirements. Um, I don't know exactly the full picture for each and every university, but there are issues surrounding hardware with uh, webcams sometimes not working properly or not starting. Um, basically, all you need to recognize people based on how they type is a keyboard. Uh, and every computer has a working keyboard. Um, you have minimum broadband requirements. So you can picture that a typing pattern is basically a kilobyte of data. Uh, you would probably be able to run typing DNA without any problem on uh, a dial-up connection, if anybody uh, remembers those. Uh, we have a solution that is privacy friendly when compared to uh, facial recognition, right? Um, it's privacy friendly and it's also uh, a better solution for those of us that are camera shy. So some students and more and more students I've heard are becoming camera shy and they're aware of their images uh, being uh, shared or tracked or they're, they're scared about that aspect. And lastly, um, our AI doesn't discriminate. And it's as simple as that. You just need to type and you need to type as naturally as it comes to you uh, to be authenticated, right? You can have people that are typing slow or you have people that are typing fast. It doesn't really matter. So long as it's you who's doing the typing, you have a pattern that is unique to you the same way that we have a way uh, that our voice sounds with our intonations, the, way, the same way that we have a way that we move around when we walk. These are all behaviors that are inherent to our body, to our experiences. And this is a really very easy way to make sure that everybody can have access to a biometric authentication that is user-friendly, accessible, and uh, also doesn't really discriminate. Um, I think that I'm kind of running out of time here. So um, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the chat. I'm glad to uh, uh, respond to them. If not, I'm going to let Jason uh, move on with uh, his part of this webinar. Certainly, great. Thank you, Alex. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to we're actually going to uh, I'm going to grab screen sharing. So Alex, if you don't mind stopping your screen sharing, and what we're going to do is we're going to jump into a a live demo, um, and we're going to take a look at um, Smarter ID uh, with typing DNA in practice. So um, you should be able to see my screen now, and um, what you'll be seeing is a Canvas LMS uh, for this. De okay, thanks, Mac. For this demo, we're just going to uh, uh, demo it here within Canvas. And before we go ahead and do it, what I want to mention is um, by design, um, what we've done is, and this goes with the Smarter ID product in general, but as it also pertains to how we integrate it with Typing DNA, by design, we're trying to make the experience as frictionless as possible for the user and as fast as possible. What we don't want to do when a student is jumping in to complete a um, uh, discussion board question, or maybe, you know, uh, fill, fill something out within the course, uh, complete an assignment. We don't want to block them 
too too long, right? So if we have to do that check, we want it to be very quick. And so what you'll see is by design, um, this is very simple, it's very easy, and uh, it's very frictionless. So I'm gonna click here into the discussions area. And this discussions area is set uh, relatively high, um, but it did not trigger that time, so I'll click again. So the way Smarter ID works is uh, it's embedded into the course in general. And you can set up different uh, percentages in which you want to challenge the student. So as you notice, the first time I went in, it didn't challenge the student. However, when I refreshed again, or if I would have clicked around again, um, it would potentially challenge me. And that's that's what we call your percentage-based, um, you know, percentage-based challenge. Uh, and you can dial that up or down uh, in the course and in different areas within the course. So anyway, uh, I have been presented with the identity check. So as a student, I simply click continue to typing authentication. And we have purposely uh, selected a very simple sentence. So um, typing DNA's best practices is a sentence between uh, 30 and 35 characters. We chose a very simple sentence, one that doesn't actually even apply to learning, um, but is quite elementary as a matter of fact. So the student would then just simply uh, type. So the fox jumped over the fence. And as you see, I did a uh, incorrect, basically a misspelling. So I have to go back and spell it correctly and click Submit. And at that point, it's done. I just authenticated. Um, in a minute, we'll look at the administrative area and we'll see how I did. Uh, but I'm gonna actually do this again. I'm gonna bounce over to Assignments and I wasn't challenged there. I'll bounce back over to Discussions. It's set relatively high uh, here, obviously for this demo, because we want to trigger this. Um, you know, for the demo. Uh, but again, it does not have to be set so high. Um, it can be set uh, much lower if required. So, okay, I'll do the fox. And I'm gonna, right now, I'm gonna actually slow down, jumped over. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing longer key presses, uh, the fence. And so that should, um, as we, when we go look at the data on the instructor side, that should actually fail. If I if I did it uh, slow enough, I started out with my normal my normal sentence typing, and then I slowed it down. So hopefully that will fail, but it's that simple. Um, it is that simple. We will randomly uh, um, prompt the user. They will have to type the sentence. It's the same sentence every time. And uh, behind the scenes, our integration with Typing DNA will then uh, analyze that sentence that was typed and let the instructor know if um, if they feel it's the student or not. Now, what we didn't look at here is enrollment, because uh, I was already enrolled as a student in this particular car course. But enrollment, uh, so the first time we see a student is quite simple. All they do is they type that sentence two times, two or three times, depending uh, on the settings. Um, so we'll cycle, they'll type the fox jumped over the fence, the fox jumped over the fence, and then they're done. They're enrolled. It is that simple. It's very, very frictionless. Um, I am going to pause a minute. I think I see some chat questions. Okay, so uh, actually we'll pick these up um, right after. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to stop sharing this screen and we're gonna jump over and we will, I'll share the instructor view. Okay, so now we are, we're in the instructor view. Uh, the instructor view is embedded uh, into the course. This is again, the same course, but I'm logged in as an instructor with LTI. So um, I will just click Smarter ID here. And um, what we do is we give uh, a general kind of overview of the challenge volume and results over time, et cetera, for the course. What I'm gonna do is just uh, toggle to all results. And um, these are the two right here that you can see that I just did here in the live demo. So at 2.31, at 2.32. That first one, as you see, was a pass. So I actually typed with my normal cadence and there was a 4% or 99% uh, confidence, as you can see here. That second one is the one where I kind of, I started at my normal cadence and then decided, you know what, let's make this one fail. So about a, um, that first or second word in, I started slowing down. So I kind of typed a little bit slower, um, just simulating a different cadence. And as you see here, we have a, a failure with a 4% confidence that it would be the same person, obviously. So definitely not the same person. Um, so when I click into one of these, we can see uh, actually the page that the challenge was presented on. And then also we use, um, 
the, the student's IP address and do a reverse geocode lookup and see where that student was essentially located as well. So um, as you can see here, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, so you can see that. Um, if, uh, if we want to jump into the fail, again, it's very similar, but it just shows that the student failed. So what you would look for here is you would just look for a student that um, is having a lot of fails, right? Having a lot of problems. And those are the students you're going to maybe want to key in on or have a discussion with and ask, um, you know, what really is going on? So uh, without getting all the way into the product um, due to kind of time constraints, uh, that is a general overview of the integration and how it works. So I will uh, pause and stop sharing and let's go ahead, Alex, I'm not sure, or Mac, if you've looked at these questions, but I'd like to go ahead and, and field some of these questions now that are within chat. Right. Yeah, we did uh, address a few of the questions that were in chat. I uh, was asking about the difference between this and bi uh, BioSig, uh, biometric signature. And what they do is finger stroke recognition, where the student uses either the mouse, I mean, the trackpad on a computer or their mouse. And so the student knows like a four digit alphanumeric thing that they have to write every time, which very similar principle. It's a behavioral uh, biometric. Um, this, someone said, well, what's the advantage of this? I think one advantage would be that this is more of a normal or a typical activity uh, because you're, we're typing a lot, right? Uh, but how often do you actually write a letter or a number with your mouse or on a, on a, you know, a touchpad? Uh, last night, I was actually ordering some tickets for an event uh, in a couple of months. And um, it's, well, it was actually tubing, <laughs> right? Snow tubing, right? And I'm taking my kids and they're minors. So I had to sign something online, uh, you know, a, a waiver for those kids. And I had to do it by drawing. And after I looked at that, I thought, that's nothing like my signature when I write it, you know? And so I've often questioned, you know, the consistency that you see. Obviously, BioSig does a good job of that. They see consistency. But from what I've seen, to be able to, to track consistency using a standard interface, a keyboard, is, is just a, a more frictionless process, you know, with typing DNA. Right. Yeah. And I, I can also just um, touch up on, on that. So, um, the the beauty and the magic of a behavioral biometric solution whatever it is is how you can constrain the behavior in such a way that you get the the most juice out of uh, the lemons that you squeeze right uh, and the time ty type of data uh, that uh, it happens to be uh, the one that we find when people are typing is pretty much consistent and stable over time. Uh, the more dynamic the range of data uh, and of behavior is when you're creating a user profile, the more all over the place a solution will be. Um, I can say that in terms of the accuracy of our solution, we have achieved unprecedented accuracy. So we can achieve a false acceptance rate. So a false positives rate of as low as 0.15% um, with free previous enrollments. And of course that comes with a trade-off uh, for false uh, negative. So it really depends on the use case and how, how you uh, set to achieve that. But in terms of the, the, the accuracy, we have really achieved something that in, in the behavioral biometrics industry is, is pretty unique. Alex, you may want to speak a little bit more to that. One of the questions in chat was, what research do you have to show that this is effective? Right. So, um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan about uh, talking uh, about our own research, obviously. And I think that uh, being uh, in, a, in a discussion here with people from academia, they, they value uh, peer review more than anything else. Um, the, the main challenge with any behavioral biometrics uh, in terms of research is that the methodology isn't clear yet. So there are only, I think, about three institutes worldwide that know how to benchmark biometrics. 
in a scientific way. And so far they've only worked with physical biometrics. The way that we benchmark our uh, behavioral biometrics and our own solutions is one way for our research. And I, I mentioned some stats previously and I don't really know exactly how uh, you know, reliable that is in general to take somebody uh, <laughs> you know, who's, uh, who's uh, telling their own numbers. But the way that the other industries do, and this is very relevant in uh, online banking, is people tend to test solutions and have pilots. And real life data is probably the best kind of data that you have. Lab data doesn't really match with uh, real life data. And so far we have been always successful with uh, POCs and uh, pilots. So people are extremely satisfied, especially when comparing to other biometric solutions out there as options for authentications in terms of uh, the user experience, in terms of uh, the feedback that they get from the users because it's something really easy, but also in terms of uh, the, the overall accuracy of the solution. You know, I'll speak to a problem, a question that Carrie asked um, about this kind of being a gatekeeper. And, you know, students who are really intent on cheating, they will find a way. All of our best efforts are really keeping honest people honest. And what we're looking for here is, is trend data. Uh, during the phases of my life when I'm being disciplined and trying to lose weight, I wear one of those Fitbit trackers that tracks my um, movement. Uh, you may have seen a commercial on TV lately about a, there's a lady sitting on a park bench and she's fastened her Fitbit to the tail of her dog. And so she gets like 40,000 steps really easy. Well. That's great. Her Fitbit did report 40,000 steps, right? But did she really get any benefit from that? Well, no. Um, but what Fitbit talks about when you read their literature is you're looking for trend data. It's trying to give you trends, your patterns with your fitness. How much are you walking during a typical day? How often are you getting up and moving around? It's all those things that we're looking at. And that's what we're looking at here. So would it be possible for a student sitting at their desk and they've got their parent also sitting there with them. And so when it asks to authenticate, the student types the sentence and then the parent gets back and does the work. Sure, right? But that would mean every time they're going to do this, every time the parent's doing the work for them, they've both got to be sitting right there. So if you've got somebody you're collaborating with at a distance, whether that's someone you've hired to do the work or a classmate, and, and you're, you've got to communicate with it, them at a distance, it's going to be a little more problematic because you've got to be consistent with that. So in time, it would be more trouble to game it than it's actually worth, right? Because you're looking for that, that trend over time. And as Jason said, you know, one, one fail, you know, shouldn't be considered, you know, that's something. But you're going to look for patterns for students that do fail frequently. And then have a conversation with them. And obviously, this is a new product for us. We don't have good practices for it yet about what do you do when a student does have a pattern of several fails? Well, then do you have some alternatives? We also still have facial recognition during Smarter ID. Maybe that person then has to authenticate using facial if they're having frequent, frequent fails with typing. Or, or maybe uh, that student, if they're having frequent fails, um, the instructor gives them a call and administers kind of an oral, you know, check for understanding exam to them. You know, there's different ways that if you've got a policy to a student and you say, if you have frequent fails, then this will be what we'll do next. It's that deterrent that we're really trying to achieve. It's like the, 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 the cop car on the side of the road that no cop is in it. When you drive by the first time, you hit your brakes, right? But if that car's there every day, you get, you get used to it, right? But we're trying to make a deterrent that the student knows is being observed and that when those trends happen, then there will be some other process put in place uh, that they would need to follow. Absolutely. I, I, I just want to touch upon this a little bit because we've actually have received this question in the past. Uh, and I know from uh, customer data how uh, cheating really manifested and the type of uh, cheating that, that was uh, described there. So what we see in our data is that at some point, 
if you do have uh, some gated challenges, right, with, uh, with uh, typing DNA, uh, you basically discourage a lot of typing by preventing it in the first place. So a lot of this is a cost balance issue for the user as well. Uh, how much are they willing to um, invest in effort and in time to always cheat uh, and, you know, do hot city seating and switch? versus um, just, you know, doing their job and learning whatever it is that they need to learn or doing the, the assignment. Uh, another thing that we see is that fraud generally has a pattern of repeating. So it's not really common that uh, you have, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, everybody is passing half of the time, failing half of the time, you have completely polarized uh, usage, right? So some users uh, definitely engage in probable fraud more often, and most users have no problem, and they, they just uh, go through, through that. So it's really hard, easy to, to uh, distinguish between the two, two behaviors. And lastly, one thing, and I don't want to really talk a lot about this because it's not uh, today's subject. Uh, I'm just going to tease this a really bit. Um, behavioral biometrics is probably um, different than any other biometric out there because it's passive. So it doesn't really require the collaboration of the user. And probably the only way that we will ever achieve some sort of continuous authentication is with something like typing biometrics. Um, it's something that we don't uh, have at the moment, but that doesn't mean that it won't be here uh, sometimes in the next years. So it's, uh, yeah, let's, let's look forward to where technology leads us. Right now at the moment, this solution addresses very well in a frictionless way um, uh, the, the issue about preventing cheating, uh, catching cheating and repetitive fraud issues and discouraging any way of cheating when people are, you know, um, accessing the system somehow remotely or being in, in multiple places at the same time. It just discourages that type of behavior. So we've got three questions. The first two Jason can speak to, and Alex the third. Um, Jason, speak to mobile capacity, how it works on mobile devices, phones and tablets. Yep. Uh, then secondly, is there an admin panel? And then Alex, for you, what about uh, users who hunt and peck? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll speak to the first one on mobile. Um, and then uh, move to the other. So yeah, so we do support if the, if the student is accessing the LMS uh, from their mobile device, uh, we do support mobile. Um, so the student would be um, challenged at random again uh, through, their, through their mobile browser, and then they can type accordingly. Now we do, the first time they type on mobile, um, or the first uh, couple times they type on mobile, they will be automatically enrolled on that mobile device, okay? Because it's a different form factor, right? Um, we do have to get their kind of typing profile on that mobile device. So the integration with typing DNA is such that the first time they enroll, um, or the first couple of times that they are, are, are challenged, they will be enrolled, and we will then have their typing biometric from that mobile device, at which time um, from then on, as they access from a mobile, um, we will, of course, uh, go against their, their typing biometric. Um, so we do have uh, typing DNA does con control two different biometrics, a keyboard, so more of a standard desktop type keyboard biometric or laptop, and then a mobile biometric. And then they can figure out which one the student is accessing from. So that's uh, the mobile question. And then the um, administrative dashboard question, um, absolutely. So we have an administrative dashboard. What I was showing was just from the course, there is a higher level that contains much of the same data, but then some additional reports. And we're always building more reports, um, suspicious activity reports, etc. Um, into that as well. So you could administer this uh, or kind of manage it at an, a more admin higher level. Um, one other, actually, one on that question, speak to uh, LMS integration, specifically Blackboard Ultra. 
Okay, so um, before I do that, I, I was going to mention one other thing that um, I don't necessarily know is clear or not in the demo, but regardless if the student fails or passes, we don't tell the student. So that's one key differentiator as well, is we don't want to alert that student. We don't want to make them concerned. It just simply goes away, unlocks, and lets them go. So I did want to kind of mention that as well, um, because I do think it's important. In terms of LMS integration, we integrate with Canvas, Moodle, and Blackboard. Uh, currently, we do not uh, can't currently integrate right now with Blackboard Ultra, just Blackboard Learn Standard, uh, because Blackboard Ultra doesn't give us some of the hooks that we need. Uh, we're currently working on some different integration methods to uh, expand into Blackboard Ultra as well as uh, D2L, uh, but those are not available. So to reiterate, Canvas, Blackboard, and uh, Moodle. And then real quick, I, I saw a question coming on pricing. So while I'm going, I'm just going to take this one real fast, Alex, and then I'll hand it over. Um, we do, we can, we can work with you on pricing. We can uh, get you in touch with a, a sales representative from uh, Smarter Services. Uh, but in general, it is priced on a per user per year. It's very affordable. And so it is priced on a per student per year basis. So Alex, uh, Regarding the question, I don't know if you saw it in Q and A. If not, I can reread it to you. Okay, you're good. So it, it's the one where um, some some people type faster, some t people type slower, uh, some people uh, w what's it called? Peek and seek, right? Or seek and peek, rather. Um, and some people do a mix of them, and that's fine. Right? Um, what we're looking at is something which is of beyond let's say the the first layer of obvious behavior and that's really where the data um, extraction piece of our technology comes in place where we look at those traits that are very very stable over time um, and that are unique to a user um, and also the machine learning uh, part of our solution find some very very deep connections between these features so some users might type uh, a cadence of letters one way faster than you will type a cadence of letters slower. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so long as you type that text that um, Jason just showed us, which one was it? The fox jumped over the fence. The way that is naturally to you and naturally you will type this differently every day. One day, maybe you had uh, one uh, cup of coffee too much and you're a bit jittery or you're typing a bit faster. Uh, sometimes uh, you might be uh, tired, right? After a long day, you might be slouching a bit. You might be typing slower. It doesn't really matter. We're looking at something that is very stable and the solution adds and learns over time how the user types. So in the beginning, it has probably the least accuracy. And then we add more typing patterns over time as the user engages with that sentence. And we define this very complex profile that is very, very uh, specific and uh, natural to the user to type that in a multitude of ways. So Alex, the question we're all wondering as we can see on your shirt, it says, show me how you type and I'll tell you, ah, who you are. Okay, we were wondering what the last line was there, what you were gonna tell us. <laughs> yeah. So um, quite funny, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, technology and we like even five years ago, you wouldn't have believed that this is actually possible. So it's a, it's a really uh, amazing the, uh, the progress that we're making in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and uh, I really think that it's a, it's a great technology for uh, addressing these challenges surrounding academic integrity uh, right now, because it's a very granular biometric identity, right? So that's really tied to that sentence. And we don't look at um, basically how people type a different sentence. We just know how people type that sentence and we specialize on that. Uh, and that makes it be very privacy friendly, very user friendly. And again, so far, people have been receiving it very, very well, wherever it's been used. 
Uh, Kathy asked about how does it handle ADA compliance, and a couple of thoughts there is that, one, it improves your ADA compliance over some other methodologies, like we were talking about with the, uh, the, the facial recognition and the learners that have, you know, challenges against that, where this is just a behavioral biometric that doesn't take in a appearance and lighting and, and, and religious garb and, you know, those type things, so it really helps with that. Um, I had one other thought about it. Um, Oh, so if a learner due to a physical disability is using an alternative keyboard or some other alternative input device, and Alex, correct me if I'm wrong here, regardless of what that device is, I mean, the student is inputting text. That's their job when they're writing a discussion post, when they're writing a paper. If they're using an alternative keyboard or something, they're inputting that data. What Typing DNA is looking at is the the rhythm, so to speak, of that data coming in and the consistency of that rhythm over time. So even if there's an alternative keyboard or some other device, I would think they can still look for those patterns in that rhythm. Is, is that a correct assumption, Alex? So the assumption is correct. Um, as long as we can get that data from the driver um, and from the keyboard, it's fine. Uh, what it probably won't work if it's, it's something like a digital keyboard. So they're just using the mouse for that. Uh, that's probably not going to work. As long as typing is going on, uh, it should be, be able to work, but there's a, a multitude of, uh, of, of keyboards out there. So I, I don't, we haven't really tested this with uh, every possible uh, keyboard to have a certain answer that this is the way that uh, it works. As we're getting close to the top of the hour, I'll make one announcement that in the survey that you guys will receive after this, uh, there is a chance for a gift card drawing if you fill out the survey. So that I think I saw about 40 something attendees. So you've got a you know one in 40 chance of winning whatever that gift card is if you fill out that survey. So uh, try to try to do that. And then one final question was about uh, asked to speak to the LMS integration process. Sure. So um, the LMS integration has a couple different pieces, um, and this is these are some of the limiting pieces uh, of, of why we can only support the three LMSs currently, but uh, it is an LTI integration. So there is LTI that, that must be uh, kind of configured. Uh, it's quite simple, but that must be done. Um, we also do tap into the API of each L, uh, LMS vendor. So we do have to do kind of an a API connection. Um, and then the third is there's a, a little script, the JavaScript that gets put in um, specific areas of the LMS that must be in, installed as well. That JavaScript actually is what's kind of tracking the user as they move all throughout the LMS. So we know where they are and we know ex actually right where um, we need to uh, you know, challenge them, et cetera. So again, like I was mentioning, we actually are working on some, um, some other integration methods that will expand our LMS capabilities and reduce the number of integration points. Like I was mentioning, there's three right now. Uh, so it'll reduce those, but today it's those three items that must be integrated. Okay, so thank you all for your attendance today. It is uh, near the top of the hour. Education is an art. It's not a perfect science, right? And so as educators, we just want to be better at our art and uh, being able to provide a tool like typing DNA um, as just an incentive for students to do their own work as a deterrent against them getting someone else to do their own work just aids us. It's a one tool uh, in our toolbox to help uh, students uh, learn better as we're trying to teach better. So thank you for your time. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email. If you'd like uh, more information, price quotes for the size of your institution, whatever, uh, please reach out and we'd love to, uh, to have you try this and give us feedback. Thank you. Have a good day.